Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Thursday morning. Uh, I think the economy is still standing. Uh, have you have you had a run on your bank yet? Are you, have you taken all your money out and put it under your mattress? I'm okay because uh, I I go to a, a large conglomerate. Um, I, I don't go to a, a mid-sized bank that invests in woke uh, policies or cryptocurrency. <laughs> so I think I'm going to be just fine, Bill. Plus, here's the other thing. You know, FDIC insures up to $250,000 in any given account. You could diversify. So I haven't quite reached the level in my savings account where I think I'm in any you know, real trouble uh, at this point. So I think I'll be okay. Okay. You're, you're not, you're not over leveraged, leveraged in crypto. I'm not over leveraged. I'm not under leveraged. I am not in crypto and I can barely give you a definition of what it is. Although I'm trying to mine some right, right this minute in my backyard. Have, have you gone to your large conglomerate banks board meetings to make sure that they're not engaging in some ridiculous woke policy? Is that going to jeopardize your money? I have not done that. Um, they may, they may we, be woking right now. You don't even know it. We have to hope that they're not. Uh, you know, I, I would prefer them to be focused on, you know, the bottom line as opposed to, you know, social justice, environment, global warming, all that, all that good stuff. You know, hey, if you want to do that, go for it, man. More power to you. But like, you be you be a hippie on your own on time. Don't do it during the work day. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, dude, I, I, you know, it's a, it's, it's about, uh, it's, it's about the shareholder, uh, whatever. Um, what's, no. what's, what's fascinating about this whole, the, the way that woke has gotten in, in, injected into this whole debate is it, it, it used to be the Republicans would say, I don't want the government mandating all of these uh, progressive values. That's not the government's job. Let the, let the market do it. Let the people do it. We, we, we can do this through through charities and corporations. We don't need the government telling us what to do. Okay, I'm a corporation. I'm going to do some nice things. Wait a second. Now you're wait, you're, you're going to be nice and, and liberal on corporate time? How dare you? Well, but I think there is a distinction to be made between, like, you know, corporate wokeism and this other thing where, for example... You know, people who manage pension, like retirement funds, are making decisions based on a progressive political agenda rather than on what will have the best return uh, for the people they're ostensibly representing. Now, this is a different topic than the bank issue, um, which I, you know, it's I, I did write a column for the Daily Beast about it. I tried to avoid getting too in the weeds on the banking stuff. I focused more. Uh, what I focused on, Bill, was was the fact that I think we now live in a country where anything that happens big, right? So whether it's a global pandemic or kind of a mini banking crisis, it will immediately be weaponized and marshaled into combat as part of the culture war. And that's what happened here, right? You had people um, on the left and the right, I think the right more guilty uh, with the woke allegation, uh, alleging that the reason that the Silicon Valley Bank specifically went under was because of of they were you know woke policies or, or whatever, um, but uh, it's it's kind of a bad thing that anytime something crazy happens in America, it will immediately become a culture war issue. Well, it's not unusual for when there is some kind of sudden news event or scandal that people with pre-cooked agendas try to layer onto it whatever their uh, policy goal is. So you know, on the left, you have people who are still mad that there was this partial rollback of Dodd-Frank in the Trump era that, that um, loosened some regulations on uh, small and mid-sized banks. And so they're quick to say, aha, I voted against this bill this happened, therefore I've been proven right. Now, it may, now I, I'm not adjudicating this debate at all. Um, I just know that some people who have said, well, it re this really wasn't a matter of there being a lighter version of stress tests for a bank that's under $250 billion in capital. Um, 
There are legitimate reasons to do that because it puts undue financial pressures on the bank. To, it's costly to do these stress tests, and we didn't. We need to burden them with that. And there are other reasons why this bank went down. Yeah, I'm not here to say who's right or who's wrong here. Uh, I'm just saying it's not strange that folks on the left would say this thing happened. I can draw a connection to this policy that occurred that I opposed, and to argue that we should change that policy. On the right. The connection of this to "quote unquote" wokeism is way more tenuous, although really not existent. Uh, and to me, it's illuminating that there wasn't a economic argument that the right wanted. Yeah, for to example, make. like interest interest rates rising. I, mm -hmm. I think. So Democrats, by and large, took a more predictable, conventional, linear. Like, like it's what you, they said, pretty much what you would expect Democrats to say. Elizabeth Warren did a little populist pandering there mm -hmm. about how like everyone's so upset about trying to give um, student loan forgiveness, and yet right. they'll bail out. You know, she played the populist card, but it's kind of what you would expect Democrats to do. Republicans or people on the right, the woke thing was a, I think, a new a new act, right? Normally what they would have said, I think, was the, the normal Republican response would have been, this is Biden's fault because Biden created inflation, which caused interest rates to have to rise. And that actually is what caused the Silicon Valley bank collapse, right? I mean, that would have been the the, the traditional Republican argument before the woke I've heard, I've heard a happened. little bit of that. I mean, that that's in the mix of things that I've heard said, but the woke thing definitely was the the more common Republican talking point, um, and it just shows that they're they're just more interested in waging that war. At least they think that is the more political fertile ground. I'm actually skeptical that it is that fertile for them, but clearly that's what. Uh, a lot of the leading lights of the party believe. Yeah. And by the I wrote a column at the Beast about this last week because there was a some sort of a survey that showed that most people like woke. If you ask people what do you think of of the term woke that most Americans uh thought it was a positive had a positive connotation to it and most people Isn't liked it? it. You know, when you dig deeper though, Bill, and you you look kind of at the cross tabs and all that stuff it was more complicated than that. Um, the things that Republicans don't like about wokeism, some of them are very unpopular. Some of them are more, it, it, it's complicated. But I will say, I think that, you know, Ron DeSantis is making, uh, and we can segue to him here in a minute because he's back in the news with the, uh, the Ukraine stuff. Um, but Ron DeSantis, of course, has made this bet that he Florida is where woke comes to die. And one of the things I learned from that survey last week, it was like in USA Today, Ipsos or something, Paul, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, when you really do kind of a deep dive into the survey results, what you find is that that the public doesn't like heavy handedness. In other words, people don't want to be told you have to use a certain pronoun or that you have to say Latin X. But they also don't want to be told that the government's taking your books or they're banning books mm -hmm. from school. Sure. And so heavy handedness was what was unpopular. Mm -hmm. um, and Ron DeSantis is heavy handed. So maybe it's a lot of times it's stuff that I may even like, um, but he's uh, heavy handed. And well, I mean, that I mean, is unpopular, the, at least according I mean, to this one survey. I mean, the DeSantis frame and I think a lot of the woke framing on the right is there are bad people on the left who believe in wokeism, you know, a phrase that no one on the left even uses at this point. Um, and they're bad and we have to defeat them by any means necessary. And I just don't think that is the frame that the middle of the road voter you know, even thinks about. They're not extremely online. Uh, if you tell them that Silicon Valley bank they had someone who was black and someone who was gay on their board. No wonder this this went down. You know, that that that's not going to be a winning argument uh, to suggest that they were distracted by 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 wanting to have a diverse board. They weren't focused on their work. Um, 
I mean, it, it, it's it's an inherently implausible. And there was, I mean, that, by the way, there was a column in the Wall Street Journal, well, that's, an opinion that's column in the Wall Street Journal that essentially made that argument. I think. Right. I mean, look, we're, any any of us who write, I write three columns a week generally. I mean, it's like there, but for the grace of God, go I. But like, man, that that does not read the way that 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 did not read well. And I'm a conservative, but reading that, uh, I don't think that was putting our best foot forward. Mm-hmm. I mean, your point about pensions, I mean, there's definitely a a complicated argument to to address whether should we be using our copious capital in investment funds and pension funds for the long-term good so we're not investing in fossil fuels that are going to destroy the planet. Uh, There's a tension between that argument and we need to do right by our shareholders and get the best returns all the time. Now, maybe there's a way to resolve the tension by saying there's, there's plenty of investment vehicles out there that aren't fossil fuels that can make shareholders money, but that's at least an, an understandable and challenging debate to have. The notion that a bank can't function properly if they're trying to hire um, diverse staff and have a diverse board uh, that's that's I think, a much harder sell uh, in today's yeah. world. Well, and Bill, there was another theme to this too. Um, I saw Don Jr. tweet about this. I saw Josh Hawley tweet about this. I'm sure there were others. And it, I don't know if you remember about two weeks ago when you were out of town and I briefed you on the train derailment in, in East mm-hmm. Palestine, Ohio. This is a similar theme, right? We had the Silicon Valley Bank which is, you know, a sort of progressive cosmopolitan bank. Um, and then you had Signal Bank in New York, right? Signature. Um, I'm sorry, sign- Signature. Good catch. Yeah. Signature Bank. Um, mm-hmm. But there was an argument being made. I think Don Jr. Or, or Holly, one of them said like, you know, would, Joe Biden wouldn't have acted so quickly if this was a, a community bank in Ohio. And Joe Biden was bailing out, you know, rich people, um, guaranteeing, however, you know, millions of dollars in their account, savings accounts uh, above and beyond the FDIC guarantee. Would Joe Biden have acted so quickly if this was a rural bank in Ohio? Does he care as much about rural people as he does about people in Silicon Valley and, and in New York? I mean... And the obvious answer is he probably would rush to help the people in a, sw- a swing state, salt of the earth, you know, real America. It's like that's Biden's bread and butter. I mean, trying Ohio to bail it. Not a swing state, Bill. I hate to tell well, you. I, I mean, you know, he went he went to Kentucky for floods, but you know, he, he's not winning Kentucky. You know, I mean, I, you know, Biden is hardly averse to going to poor white communities and and uh, f- have a common bond with them. The fact that Silicon Valley is what makes us harder for Biden to deal with, not easier. Uh, but they, they concluded that there was enough risk of contagion that could start to have bigger uh, a domino effect on the rest of the banking system and, and their regular people that they had to nip it in the bud. I mean, this was the whole yeah. challenge with the bigger bailout in 2008. Uh, uh, so I, I don't think the Don Jr. argument is going to have a whole lot of traction. No, but I, I, think, think, it's, it's, I think it's telling because you're seeing that there are these very consistent themes that, you know, whether it's the train derailment or a bank crash, the same things. We It's a pattern. It's a trend, right? Mm-hmm. It's Biden and Democrats are only there for these diverse communities. Who well, they're, are well, they're, ve- they're very educated and clearly the Republicans, or at least Republicans sort of driving the message train right now are so wedded to that frame that they're going to push it regardless of circumstance. And I don't have a lot of hard evidence that that is a smart frame for them. Now, it may be that it's so comfortable that if you're running in the Republican primary, for example, presidential primary, you are going to feel obligated to push it. I mean, you, you have, the, I think we talked about it last week, this guy, um, Vivek, I forget his last name, 
know, he was definitely out there pushing the anti woke message in the wake of this bank failure. Uh, and that's his whole bread and butter is he's he's the CEO of anti woke Inc. Uh, and someday that will whole, be your bank. <laughs> um, and that to me just feels like something that only resonates with this niche of the Republican electorate. And to the average person, they don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, so my, my see- mom who my mom who lives in um, lives in West Virginia. I'm sorry, lives in Pennsylvania. You know, she voted for Trump in 2016 mm-hmm. um, because she went to the saw this Dinesh D'Souza movie about about Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. Um, did not vote for Trump in 2020. Um, I've not yet, Bill. People may know that uh, I'm writing a book. We we've not announced anything about it, but mm-hmm. uh, but my mom was we've read it, Bill. But my mom was reading because my mom used to be a proofreader at Doubleday mm-hmm. Book Publishing Company in Smithsburg, Maryland, their branch, believe it or not. Uh, so my mom was editing this book, and she had to call me up and ask me what woke is, what woke <laughs> what woke means. <laughs> Um, so that, then, that's just, I mean, that's like one person, it's totally anecdotal, yeah. but this was three months ago. So I mean, and, and, this is, this is yeah. not even like a, you know, moderate non-voter. This is a conservative voter, yeah, uh, but not someone who like spends her day on Twitter, right? No, she's never been on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, so so let, let's shift gears to DeSantis. You mentioned him before yeah. and the other big news of the past few days is that Tucker Carlson, uh, your good friend, um, uh, he had a questionnaire they sent to everyone that presumably is running, not not declared, but presumably running for president, and to get their uh, opinion on Ukraine. Uh, I, th- yeah. I think it was more than one question in the question. Well, and let me let me just stop you there, Bill, because you, uh, I I tweeted. That I have never heard in my whole life. I've never heard of a TV show sending out a questionnaire. This is something in my world, my understanding, is something I've seen groups like the National Right to Life do or Concerned Women for America, kind of, or the National Pro Life Alliance. They basically want to get you on the record, um, A, so that they know whether or not to give you money or endorse you. B, so that they could potentially use something you say against you if you mm-hmm. if you flip flop, right? So, this is something that, in my experience, has been done generally by activist organizations and ideological packs. I am not familiar with TV shows doing this. Now, you said on Twitter, and I did not mm-hmm. have a chance to depose you before uh, mm-hmm. our podcast today, but you said on Twitter that this is not not unusual. Well. I mean, I think you are kind of right in the main here, but I, you know, over the last campaign, I, I would be Googling around trying to like figure out, okay, what, what a Republican candidate said on social security, for example, and I would come across some local TV news articles, which were based on questionnaires that helped me, you know, get that answer. You know, they weren't loaded questions. It so wasn't this is an, sort I, of like the way that a newspaper might in the olden days when people yeah. read newspapers, um, maybe it's for an endorsement or maybe it's just for the public's well, I, knowledge. I, I would... do think there's sort of a, I think because news gathering has gotten, I think so many people are doing it on the cheap these days, that it's easier to send a questionnaire than actually schedule an interview and ask probing follow-up questions. So yeah. they want to get some cheap, easy content. They send the questionnaire out, the candidates give their stock answer and then they just post and they just post the answer on the local news. Uh, so I, I, I have seen that done. What Tucker did is more like what an activist organization would do when they're trying to decide who to endorse with a lot of loaded questions, lots of ideological pitfalls. Campaigns have to like figure out, okay, well, how, what, how can I phrase this to not make them angry so they won't like say, be mad at me, but maybe I don't totally box myself in down the road. Uh, there, this felt more like that. Uh, yeah. But, but, in, and yet, and yet, and yet you had to publicly contradict me. On, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, that, that's good. That, that's helpful. That's helpful. And I'm yeah. not trying to even criticize Tucker because, um, 
you know, I, I don't think this is inherently bad. And maybe it just maybe it actually just provides more information to the public. Right. But well, it, does but it show did, strike, it did much... strike me as it struck me as is, is not normal. Not well, normal. it shows how Tucker wants to shape this presidential primary. I mean, it's a it was an aggressive act because he is, you know, a well a widely watched show in conservative circles. Uh, he has a very distinct worldview when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, and you know he is very willing to name and shame people that he disagrees with. So it's it's essentially, it's a threatening act for him to send the questionnaire out. I, mean, I don't mean to say that in too mean a way, um, but you, you, I think you get what I'm saying. Uh, and it's newsy what is then reported back to him. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, people now know, I mean, that whether DeSantis is getting the better or the worse of this uh, yeah. development, we, we can debate. Um, but well, so, it's so Tucker's just, attempt to try to move the field in his direction. I agree. So just to sum it up, DeSantis said, and, and there's arguments that he provided lots of escape hatches and caveats in the specifics, but in the broad stroke, what DeSantis said is that supporting Ukraine is not in the vital national interest of the United States. Is that I correct? Want, I, just want to get, I just want to get the exact... Um, Damn you with your facts, Bill, and your details. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, so, blah, 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 blah. Um, sorry to pull this up here. Here we go. Um, while the U.S. has many vital national interests, securing our borders, addressing the crisis of readiness within our military, achieving energy security and independence, and checking the economic, cultural, and military power of the Chinese Communist Party, becoming further entangled, becoming further entangled in a territorial dispute between Ukraine and Russia is not one of them. The Biden administration's virtual blank check funding of this conflict for as long as it takes without any defined objectives or accountability, distracts from our country's most pressing challenges. Without question, peace should be the objective. The U.S. should not provide assistance that could require the deployment of American troops or enable Ukraine to engage in offensive operations beyond its borders. F-16s and long-range missiles should therefore be off the table. These moves would risk explicitly drawing the United States into the conflict and drawing us closer to a hot war between the world's two largest nuclear powers. That risk is unacceptable. A policy of regime change in Russia, no doubt popular among the DC foreign policy interventionists, would greatly increase the stakes of the conflict, making the use of nuclear weapons more likely. Such a policy would neither stop the death and destruction of the war, nor produce a pro-American Madisonian constitutionalist in the Kremlin. History indicates that Putin's successor in this hypothetical would likely be even more ruthless. The cost to achieve such a dubious outcome could become astronomical. Um, there, there's a few more paragraphs here, but I think you get the oh, oh, yeah, I mean, last thing here. The Biden administration's seems... policies have driven Russia into a de facto alliance with China because yeah. China has not and will not abide by the embargo. Russia has increased its foreign revenues while China benefits from cheaper fuel. Coupled with this intentional depletion, with his intentional depletion of the strategic petroleum reserve and support for the left's Green New Deal, Biden has further empowered Russia's energy dominated economy and Putin's war machine at Americans expense. Wow. There's a lot there. Well written. <laughs> I think, um, you know, there's some things in there I agree with, but there's a lot of bullshit and a lot of sophistry and the assertions that it's our fault, but we've driven Russia into the hands of China is bullshit. It's wrong. The assertion that this is merely a territorial dispute um, is one way of framing uh, what it's called when one nation invades a neighbor. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things like that in there that I would uh, have a major, uh, major problem with. But, um, but rather than, you know, debating, you know, the substance of, of that, um, let's talk about the politics, Bill, because in my view, this is clearly... This tells us a few things. 
It tells us how powerful Tucker Carlson is, obviously. Um, it tells us um, what direction DeSantis at least perceives the Republican electorate is moving in vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. And it tells us, I think it answers the question now definitively, what type of campaign is Ron DeSantis going to run? Now, it's become conventional wisdom for a long time now that DeSantis wants to be Donald Trump, like a younger version of Donald Trump without the crazy tweets, right? Um, and that was always conventional wisdom. But look, we always thought, well, maybe he'll also try to kind of be a hybrid. Maybe he'll try to keep the Matt Lewis's of the world, you know, on the hook as well. I think now we know that DeSantis really has committed to this bit. He is mini Trump, as as Charlie Sykes says in his newsletter, that this he is going to run and like no distance between Trump and DeSantis. The only contrast is going to be that DeSantis is younger and has been a more competent uh, MAGA guy. I, what do you say? I mean, I, I basically agree with all that. I do think there are some very subtle caveats or at least points of wiggle room in the statement. Um, you know, for example, he makes a big deal about they wouldn't send F-16s or, or long range missiles to, so for Ukraine to go beyond its own borders. Biden has said, um, he said uh, last month to ABC, uh, no, he doesn't need F-16s now. Uh, there's no rational base. Um, so he was asked, is, is there no rational basis upon which there's, is, is there no basis upon which there is a rational corner of our military to provide F-16s? Biden said, I am ruling it out for now. So yeah. you know, Biden has his own wiggle room there. But, and so DeSantis is being more definitive. But his, pos his position is not pull out of Ukraine. He's saying no further entanglement. Well, what does that mean exactly? Is he basically saying status quo? Well, if he's status quo, then he's in line with Biden. Because <laughs> that's, that's what Biden's pursuing. Trump has said that we should you know, cut off funds and engage in peace negotiations and effectively uh, do a land for peace. There's well, some... I mean, DeSantis did say in that that paragraph or three that you read that our ultimate, you know, our, I, I don't even know how he said it, but he said peace. Peace is the now, objective. If peace is your objective, you can have it today. Ukraine right. surrenders unconditionally. Right. There will be peace. Um, that is a, I'll use the term again since I've already said it, that is a bullshit thing to say. I like, I agree that it and the 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 few Republican hawks left who are mad at DeSantis for calling it a territorial dispute, peace the objective. Like DeSantis deserves those criticisms, uh, but it does make me wonder if, like deep deep down, if he was actually president, does this mean he would be Trumpian and actually do a land for peace, or he just continue yeah. the status quo? Which well, and that's the hope. I mean, Ron DeSantis is on the record in the past criticizing Democrats for not being uh, strong enough allies of Ukraine. And he was sort of a more conventional Republican congressman. And so I think there is the hope that he's the hope is he's lying now that this <laughs> is pandering to win the primary. And that escape hatch, those caveats that you mentioned, Bill, that you pointed out, those little loopholes that after he becomes the nominee, maybe after he becomes president, but certainly after, if, if he wanted to evolve, that he has mm -hmm. allowed himself to do that rhetorically. I still think my point holds. When it comes to the Republican primary, he is now committed to the bit. We know what his strategy is going to be in the primary. I, 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 only, I hesitate from saying that definitively was two things. One is, is this politically necessary to do, to, to go down the Trump-Tucker path? And I wrote about this at the Washington Monthly last month. My read of the existing poll data is the Republican Party is pretty split on this. The Republican voters are pretty split on this. Uh, so there's room to be the, the hawk here. There's room for a Pence or a Haley. That's the path that they're, they're going down now. 
And, you know, Kirsten Soltis over at Echelon Insights, Bill, your former sparring partner here in uh, yes. in, in the Weekend Blog. Um, yes. I saw she tweeted, you know, she's a pollster. She tweeted yeah. um, some sort of graph yesterday, I think, Bill, that showed that you're right. Al although Republican opinion is divided, it is clearly trending in the Tucker direction. Like yes, indisputably well, trending that way. There's much more energy there. They're, they're definitely making it to a much bigger thing. And the Republican hawks have been more sort of voce. However, it is notable that, you know, the Lindsey Grahams and the John Thunes and the Mitch McConnells, I don't, I don't know if McConnell said anything openly, um, uh, they're mostly coming out of the Senate. Yeah. Mitch McConnell is indisposed at the moment. Right, right. But he has been, uh, he has been outspoken on this. Right. Um, that they were very quick to criticize DeSantis and not make excuses for DeSantis. They, they didn't do what I just did. They didn't. They didn't parse every last phrase. Like, well, Lindsey I just Graham really mean him, this. Lindsey Graham like compared him to Neville Chamberlain. No, so, no Graham was interesting because you know, Graham was endorsed Trump. You know, Graham is. Yeah. One but of I, the think, biggest I think then, I think Graham, in fairness, I think Lindsey Graham later blamed Joe Biden. For the whole thing, so right. I mean, I mean, I mean, Trump has a worse position than DeSantis on this from the Lindsey Graham perspective, and yet Graham refuses to criticize Trump in any way for it. He lays into Biden, lays into DeSantis. I mean, the, Biden is the person doing what Graham wants to be done, for the most part. I mean, when when uh, when Biden uh, uh, endorsed saying the tanks over to Ukraine, Graham praised Biden. Uh, so. You know, Graham is always totally incoherent. Um, perhaps. Well, no, I think he wants to be a neocon. I mean, we know that. He is but... a neocon. He, yeah. Most, it's not even a question. And he just makes excuses for Trump when Trump doesn't play along because he wants to exactly. be in Trump's good graces. And I use the term um, loosely. I mean, technically, a neocon would be a typically Jewish intellectual who used to be a Democrat. But you know what I'm saying. He's like you don't you don't you don't whatever. have to be Jewish to be a neocon though. You mean no no the, the, but but I think by definition you had to have been a Democrat. Yeah, the initial was, phrase was someone someone yeah. who was kind of like a hawkish Democrat who got uh, the reality. party's part for a policy that the party would do to down the peacenik path and then became more. It, it was also concerned. crime and stuff like that. But anyway, I don't want to get yeah. bogged down in semantics. People know what I mean when I say that about Lindsey Graham. Yes, yes. Now, but but outside of Graham, other Republicans who you might think would be, you know, they don't like Trump and they want some, they want a non-Trump, and they think, well, DeSantis might have to do a little dance to win, but we know deep down he's with us. Let's make excuses for him. They didn't do that. They go, they were upset with DeSantis for giving credence to these Trumpian, the Trumpian framing of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Which makes me wonder, are they going to gravitate to a Mike Pence or a Nikki Haley or a Chris Sununu or a Chris Christie? I don't know what they're all going to say on the subject. Um, so I, I wonder if DeSantis hurt himself by cutting off an avenue of support that he might need to stitch together a broad coalition. Yeah. But to, <clears throat> but to, and, and, but to your other point, Matt, it still may be that he can't go all the way down the Trump Tucker path. And they're going to be in a debate setting and Trump's going to say, I want to cut off funding. I want to do land for peace. And to say this just can't bring himself to go that far. And so that daylight is still there and he's stuck in a no man's land. Uh, so yeah. I so I agree with you that like tonally, optically, that's where he's trying to signal. I just don't know if he's prepared to go all the way down. That's the a path. good point because Trump is Brilliant, just viscerally brilliant at doing things just like you, uh, just like you just described. Um, I wonder how many Republican primary voters are going to be voting strategically. In other words, will I vote for? I'm a Repub I'm a registered Republican now in in West Virginia. When I lived in Virginia, you, you don't have to register. So that's why I was able to vote yeah. in the Democratic primary for Biden against Bernie. But I'm registered as a Republican, so I have to vote in the primary. I mean, if I'm going to vote, it'll be in that primary. Will you know? Would I vote strategically? Which is to say, there's only one person that can stop Trump. That's Ron DeSantis. 
So I'm going to hold my nose and vote for DeSantis. Or would I say, no, you know what? Actually, Mike Pence or Nikki Haley is more in line with my values, certainly as it pertains to Ukraine, which I think is a big deal. I, I think it's a very big deal that, that, that this, this isn't just about Ukraine. This is about China too, Bill. So that's the other bullshit thing that Ron DeSantis is saying, that we should be focused on China. No, if you want to be focused on China, save Ukraine. If, if you make Russia pay for invading Ukraine, that will send a message to China. Or if you allow Russia to invade Ukraine, that will also send a message to China. So I think this is a big issue. But will people like me, will Republicans, we want to come home. We want to come home to the Republican Party. We want to vote Republican. Do we vote DeSantis strategically? Because say what you will about him, but Bill, he hasn't started a coup yet. Or will we vote now? Like, eh, I can't bring myself to vote for DeSantis. It doesn't matter. Trump will probably win anyway. I'm going to vote for Mike Pence. That's a big question. Well, that's actually my question for you. Uh, that I, that's what I wanted to ask going into this. Is DeSantis's statement disqualifying to you? Well, here's the thing. This this will be me. We now I'll be weaselly, um, but I'll tell you the truth about my thinking. Um, number one, the que one question will be. Do I get the sense that DeSantis is saying what he has to say to win the primary and that he's actually going to govern like a normal Republican would? That he, In other words, my best hope is that he's lying to us now. Can I believe, do I believe that? And, and I, there's more to see to get a feel for whether he's truly committed to the bit or whether he is still an internationalist. The other thing would be, frankly, like, how close is it? I doubt if West Virginia is going to matter in terms of who wins the Republican nomination. But like, let's say that I lived in a state that did matter. Um, I would have more liberty to vote my conscience or my preference if it if it didn't matter but if if my, if i felt like my vote could be what stopped donald trump if i felt my vote for ron desantis could be the thing that stops donald trump donald trump being the only person that i know of who has incited an insurrection in america if voting for desantis stops trump then maybe that's the that's the calculus so if, if I may interpret what you're saying, what I'm hearing is DeSantis' statement is upsetting, but not quite disqualifying. And if when it's game time, if you're looking at the polls and you see perhaps a more Reaganite Republican has got a shot at this, you probably vote for that person. But if it's really narrowed down to a Trump versus DeSantis race, you would you would see DeSantis as the lesser evil, for lack of a better term. I mean, I think that's a fair interpretation. My only caveat would be I, what happens between now and then if DeSantis mm -hmm. continues saying things that are scary or outrageous or just strike me, they, they contradict my beliefs and values, then I'll have to reassess. But as of now... Um, I see this as a very uh, problematic sign, to use a term of, of art of the day. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if if Mike Pence is at 1% and hasn't won any states, and Nikki Haley is at 2% and hasn't won any states, and it, let's say Trump, you know, DeSantis wins Iowa and Trump wins New Hampshire and... It, if it's close, then I think you have to go lesser of two evils. And as bad as DeSantis may be, um, he hasn't tried to stop the, you know, a free and fair election or the peaceful transfer of power. So I think that gives him an edge in my book. I do Call think there is, <laughs> I mean, I, I think Haley tried to do this, um, with a statement, but she doesn't have, I think, a big enough platform yet to do it easily. But 
I, I think there's an opening for a Hawk here. Uh, and, you know, Pence and Haley are the two. Like, if, if Pence was ready to announce and he announced next week and he centered the speech on being steadfast, steadfast for Ukraine, may take some shots at Biden for not being steadfast enough, you know, try to, you know, put some to try to say we, we would we would we would win this war and he's not winning the war, that kind of thing. Um, that to me would be the smartest move to make right now. That that yeah. there there there's a constituency in the Republican Party that's not being served by what Trump and DeSantis are doing. Yeah, speaking of committing to the bit, Pence should just accept the fact that he is not gonna be liked by Trump's people. And he's not gonna peel off any of them. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I think there's about 35% of them. They're not gettable, right? Even for Trump's vice president, particularly when Trump's running, but it wouldn't even matter in the case of Mike Pence, you know, because he wouldn't carry out Trump's very simple orders, you know, to uh, to participate in the coup. Um, so why doesn't Pence just own it? Like own his brand, own his lane, own his niche? Well, he might. And, I mean, he hasn't yeah. announced yet. I mean, he's definitely been inching in that way. He made his very tough comments on Trump at the gridiron dinner and uh, he has he has been very blunt about Ukraine to date, and there's there's no room in our party for you know Putin apologists. So I think he's positioned himself to do that. I think I, if I were him, like like now is the time to really do it. You know, DeSantis has made his move. Now's your chance to say, uh, not Trump is wrong on this, and DeSantis is phony on this. I would just punch him right in the face and own your lane. I like it. Bill, almost out of time. I got to go write a column where I will uh, probably write about this topic, to be honest with you. Um, However, before we go, uh, you mentioned Mitch McConnell. Uh, I wrote a column Mm -hmm. this week at the Daily Beast saying, um, whatever you think of Mitch McConnell, you're going to miss him when he's gone. What do you think? Are you going to miss him? Yeah, honestly, uh, I'm, I'm definitely worried about who follows him. I mean, you know, he's the older knock on- than Joe Biden yeah. and Donald Trump, by I mean, the way. The Democratic animus towards McConnell, well earned, uh, is that he essentially bent the rules to stack the Supreme Court uh, and has and was a maximum obstructionist during the Obama era. And has, has it doesn't believe in anything but raw power and. Uh, and uh, doesn't put you know country over over party. That's essentially the narrative on McConnell. And there's been a lot of profiles of McConnell and books on McConnell that all tend to come down to he believes in nothing. There's the, the, he's just he's just a political calculator and has has no principle driving him. I, I think the past. I mean, I'm not defending anything that he's done in the past that that, that has fed to that narrative. But he has believed in Ukraine. He has believed in not shutting down the government and not violating the the, the debt limit. You know, there, there are, he has some guardrails <laughs> that, you know, Trump and others have not had. Um, and Biden's presidency has been a pretty functional presidency in part because of the help he provided. He has rallied votes for a number of. I mean, it's the thing that you know Trump has tried to criticize McConnell on. But for some, um, for some Republicans, that's a bug, not a, not a feature. Well, that's right. But I think Democrats should worry as much as they hate McConnell, as much as they've reason to hate McConnell, that he is not the literal worst who could be in that position, and the person that follows him might well be worse, might be even more nihilistic, might be much more yeah. willing to violate the debt limit, might be willing to cater to. The America Firsters on Ukraine, uh, and that could lead to a much more destabilized federal government. So, uh, I mean, yeah. if it's and Thune, by the way, I mean, it might be fine, but I, I don't know if it's going to be soon. Everyone listening probably knows. I mean, the reason we're talking about him is he he fell and is concussed, and I think he's still in the hospital. Mm-hmm. But um, I would argue, as a conservative, Bill, that Mitch McConnell. If the thing that we've been fighting for for um, you know for like fifty years was overturning Roe, I would argue that Mitch McConnell is the single most important conservative politician for accomplishing that. And in fact, had he not held open that uh, Supreme Court that seat that vacancy, then Trump probably doesn't win. Trump probably doesn't get to pick three conservatives 
that McConnell got confirmed, I should add. Uh, so, um, but but I think the big thing is that that Mitch McConnell has been, you know, he, he's disappointed me. Like I thought he should have voted to uh, convict Trump and the second impeachment. And the fact that he didn't, despite giving this very compelling speech, pointing out all of Trump's sins and crimes, I, I think is a, a black mark on McConnell's record. But he has been incredibly outspoken um, and standing up against Trump multiple times when no one else would. And I will tell you, whoever replaces him will not be as good as Mitch McConnell. They will not be as good as a conservative. They will not be as good in terms of being effective and smart. And as an American who cares about preserving liberal democracy, they will not be as good. You don't think Thune will be as good? Thune? No. I think Thune shares McConnell's worldview. I don't think he is as savvy a political operator and as tough as Mitch McConnell. But who is? I mean, he's, you know, he's the Nancy Pelosi of Mitch McConnell is our Nancy Pelosi. Well, you know, McConnell had the advantage of having built his relationships ahead of the Trump rise. So he didn't have to start from scratch and play catch up during that. He had his base of support in the Senate and was able to navigate, you know, rocky political terrain. Um, Thune has to start over uh, and it might be harder for him to build a network of Republican establishment senators willing to defy Trump from time to time. Uh, I, mean, I think it would be an assumption that Thune would be the replacement. I mean, well, I think he might Thune not is, be. Well, might, Thune might, is might next in, in the hierarchy, but like Rick Scott, who was endorsed by Donald Trump, just right. challenged Mitch McConnell. Now, he didn't get very far, but, you know, uh, there's people like Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz. I mean, who knows where this thing could go? Well, I presume Scott did what he did to try to get a head start for the next, because McConnell can't live forever. And um, it didn't want it just to be a, a coronation of Thune. So uh, it might be harder if, if, if a Trump or whoever makes it a polarizing choice, you know, don't pick the establishment person, pick the disruptor. Uh, and we get a disruptor, then that could be very, very bad. So I, I definitely am nervous about what follows McConnell. Uh, and ho hopefully he's doing some legwork to try to have a smooth transition to Thune. And hopefully Mitch McConnell, who's already the longest serving leader, Senate leader in history, uh, will be around for a lot longer. And on that note, Bill, what do you want to plug? Uh, I do a piece in the monthly this week about warrantless surveillance, Section 702 of the FISA law. Uh, those who know me know I've, I've, I've defended uh, these practices for a long time. And, this, and even though the controversies have largely faded since the days of the Snowden leaks, there is a chance that this, this is up for reauthorization this year. It expires at the end of the year. Uh, and because the Republican Party has gotten more Trumpified, anti-FBI, anti-deep state, uh, there is some question how easy it's going to be to reauthorize the program. Uh, and I lay into all the history and the reasons why it really should be reauthorized. Uh, so that's over at the Washington Monthly right now. Cool. Um, I've already shamelessly promoted all my Daily Beast columns, but I will say I had a, uh, a WordPress uh, debacle this week, which prevented me from posting a lot of podcasts over at Matt Lewis in the news. Um, but I did get one up. Uh, David McCormick, Bill, who ran for the U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania against Dr. Oz. And he's got a new book out. We talked about that. We talked about Donald Trump endorsing his opponent, what that a was newsy like. There. A bit of a newsy interview. He's revealing what Trump said to him. He did. It's in the, I mean, in fairness, it's in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but I may be the first, I put I put the tweet out. I may be the first person to ask him about it. Um, and, and it was one of those, well, no, you know what? Go listen to my podcast. I won't even tell you. <laughs> uh, but, and, and the, by the way, uh, McCormick very well could be the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania in 2024. 
against Bob Casey. There's talk that Republicans may just clear the field for him, give him a clean shot at uh, the general election. So check out my conversation with him uh, at Matt Lewis and the News. Very exciting. Uh, All right. We'll talk again uh, next week. Always a pleasure. Follow us on Twitter at the DMZ. Is that right? No. Strike that. <laughs> that was taken. Follow us on Twitter at DMZ Show. Uh, and if you're listening, go go to youtube.com slash Matt Lewis and subscribe and like. Even if you don't watch us, that's where we are. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you back here next week. Take care. See you, Bill.